Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's have everybody take their places. I think we have two of the three candidates here. Diana? On the second row, yeah. All right. So good evening, everyone. And yeah, thank you all for coming to the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Candidates Forum. My name is Paul Rives. I am a past president of the Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce and currently serving on the Chamber's Executive Committee. The Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce is a voluntary member, nonprofit organization comprised of hundreds of businesses throughout Pittsburgh and in East Contra Costa County. The Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce is very pleased to co-sponsor this event with the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. But before I introduce our moderator, I'd like to thank the many volunteers that helped made this event possible. First, I'd like to thank the volunteers from the League of Women Voters who are serving as our timekeepers for the evening. I thought they were gonna bring air horns, but we're gonna do the cards and we'll keep it quiet and keep it simple. Yes, thank you. Um, and also volunteers from the League of Women Voters will be going around and collecting uh, index cards. So, and there we are there. So if you have any questions that you would wanna submit to the question screener to potentially ask the candidates, uh, they will go around collecting the index cards uh, so we can look at those questions. And we'd also like to thank Los Padanos Community College for allowing us to host this forum in this beautiful auditorium and uh, Trin Nguyen of LMC is here in the auditorium as well. You can you go ahead and raise, raise your hand. Uh, and we, the chamber would like to thank you for your support and, and for helping make this possible. Um, I'd also like to recognize Devon Alexander, who's in the back there. Uh, he's gonna be streaming this event live on Facebook Live so that the people, other people can watch this event at home in real time. Um, and also Facebook Live will allow the viewers to submit questions and comments in real time throughout the forum. So remember, we're not just speaking to the people here in this auditorium, uh, but also out there on Facebook, for which all you know could be all 2.1 billion Facebook users, so watch out for that. Um, I'd like to recognize and thank my father, Ronald Rives, uh, for reviewing and sorting the audience questions. Uh, Ron Rives is a former three-time president of the Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, a former member of the Board of Directors for the Contra Costa County Bar Association, and a two-time mayor of the city of Pittsburgh. I wanna thank the chamber staff, Monica and Leanne, as well as Martha Goralka and Ann Flynn of the League of Women Voters that helped coordinate this event. And of course, in playing a significant role in making this all happen is our moderator, Gail Murray. And this is not Gail's first rodeo. Uh, she did an outstanding job moderating a previous forum with these same candidates at the Lesher Center in Walnut Creek on April 24th of this year. And Gail is a longtime member of the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, which is a nonpartisan organization. Her participation in tonight's forum is part of the League's mission to encourage informed and active participation in government. Gail is a former mayor and council member of the city of Walnut Creek, a former mayor of the board of directors of BART, and a former chair of the Capital Corridor Joint Powers Agency. She's the current president of Gail Murray Consulting, and she focuses on transportation policy and planning. 
She's also a research assistant of the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. And Gail has also served as acting assistant general manager at AC Transit District and the acting director of transportation for the University of California at Berkeley. Almost done. <laughs> Gail received her BA from San Jose State University and her master's in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. So without further ado, please welcome Gail Murray, our moderator. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. We're hoping that some people are lost out in front and will come back this way and join you. But we're happy that you're here, and as Paul said, I am from the League of Women Voters of Diablo Valley. We are nonpartisan. We don't support candidates, and uh, so, none of, so we're just here to be a neutral party in this. Uh, we don't support any political parties. Um, before this occurred, before I, we started, the candidates pulled a number, and um, they're sitting in the rotation that they pulled. So Dinah Becton will make the first opening statement, and then we'll be in reverse order at the end, and she will make the, the closing statement. Um, I believe that this Facebook uh, screening will also be on the Chamber's website for later viewing. Is that correct, Paul? Yes. Yeah. So tell your friends and neighbors if they didn't sign up tonight that they can see it later. <clears throat> um, so I will be asking them questions, uh, and I will alternate between and among the candidates so that nobody has an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, the opening questions have been, be, have been prepared by the Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce, but we are getting, as Paul mentioned, some over the internet and some from you in the audience. So if you do want to ask a question, get a, a little three by five card, write it down, and they will bring it up to Don to make sure that we are not Ron. How many times am I going to do this? Ron. <laughs> Uh, so that uh, we are not duplicating any of the questions. Um, so each member, oh, and the other thing about the questions is, the question should be a question that all three of the candidates can answer. Don't aim a question at one candidate only, because then it will be screened out by Ron. <laughs> um, each candidate will have a minute and a half to answer the questions. Personal attacks are not permitted, but statements about other candidates must be from the public record. And if they are, they'll be allowed, and if they're not, they won't be allowed. Candidates may make rebuttals to statements by any other candidates, oh, no more than twice during this hour and a half, and the rebuttals are limited to 60 seconds. Each speaker will be timed in their answer of the question, the minute and a half they have, and our league ladies up in front will hold up something showing them that they have 15 seconds left and when they, sh they need to stop. So this forum is being streamed on Facebook, and so it's really important that if you haven't done so now, turn off your cell phone, because we don't want those ringing during the forum, um, and no unauthorized videos, recordings, or, um, or videos. So, and I also want, I know there are supporters of each of the candidates in the audience, but I want to remind you that you shouldn't cheer or heckle or applaud any of the statements. That only takes time away from the candidates. So, we will now begin with the two-minute opening statements, beginning with Ms. Diane, Dinah Becton. Thank you. So, good evening, everyone. And I am Dinah Becton, and it is my honor and my uh, privilege to serve as your district attorney for Contra Costa County. Um, I've been uh, in the office now, as you know, appointed by the Board of Supervisors out of a field of 12 candidates to bring a fresh set of eyes, efficiencies to the office, and also to bring about criminal justice reform for Contra Costa County. Prior to serving as your district attorney, I was a judge for 22 years in Contra Costa County. And that gave me a breadth of experience that I think is so important for this seat that I hold as a district attorney. I served in assignments that are very varied, including civil, criminal. In that assignment, I handled uh, some of the most 
uh, toughest cases, murder, rape, sexual assault cases, child molestation cases, as well as civil, juvenile cases, consumer, wage theft, environmental cases, and um, as I think I mentioned juvenile, and also real estate and probate. So it gives me a broad breadth of experience and knowledge about the kinds of cases that are handled by the district attorney's office. In addition to that, I was elected as the presiding judge of Contra Costa County Superior Court, which means I was over all of the courts in Contra Costa County, including a budget of over $54 million. That gave me the uh, leadership experience that is needed to serve as the chief executive officer in Contra Costa County's district attorney's office. I'm happy to have a chance to talk to you about some of the things that are important to me, like the um, uh, new opportunities for our juveniles, as well as bail reform. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Graves. I graduated law school in 1995, and since that time, I have dedicated my career to serving this community as a prosecutor. My wife and I fell in love with Contra Costa County, and we decided to raise our family here. Now, as a prosecutor for the last 22 plus years, I have prosecuted some of the most difficult crimes, most heinous crimes in our county. Uh, gang crimes, violent crimes, sexual assault crimes, and homicides. And everybody that's known me through the course of my career has uh, given me their trust in this process, including the East Bay Times, who noted that I'm the only person in this campaign with meaningful experience as a prosecutor. They also said I have the necessary tools to get the job done. It is also my privilege to have the trust of all of our public safety partners, prosecutors, firefighters, as well as law enforcement officers throughout the county. <coughs> and also the child victim advocate, Mark Klass, as well as defense attorneys and retired judges who have all seen me over the years develop as a young prosecutor into a supervisor. And I currently supervise the family violence unit, which is sexual assault, elder abuse, and domestic violence. And previous to that, I supervised the homicide team. Now, to have the support from people who have actually seen you in your job and known you, not as just a prosecutor, but as a supervisor, is very important to me. They know I'm their partner in justice, and they know I'll always do the right thing. The support and the trust from all of these individuals shows that I am the one person that they believe will make the needed changes in the office, I will keep the community safe, and that I am the person who will better serve victims of crime. So thank you for being here tonight, and I look forward to an engaging dialogue with all of you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lawrence Strauss. And since this is a business forum of the business community, what I'd like to do is just highlight my business experience for the audience. I graduated cum laude, a magic cum laude from USC in 1988 with a degree in business. My emphasis was real estate investments and finance. When I went to Loyola Law School, I graduated in 1991, it wasn't criminal law. My emphasis was in bankruptcy, commercial lending, and real property. Uh, shortly thereafter, I opened up my law, own law practice. I was uh, handling eviction cases because my father, who was a plumbing contractor, worked for a lot of management companies, and we needed someone to do the evictions. So I called my wife over to help me serve the cases. I'd get the papers and actually go down and file the papers myself. I did everything myself. Thereafter, I was picked up by an environmental company in Los Angeles called Ensotec. They worked on a lot of Superfund projects, cleaning contaminated soil. I did everything for that company. The first day on the job, I walked into my office and there was a stack of about 10 lawsuits. And the president of the company said, handle it. And that's what I did. Um, during my early, early years of practicing law, I was in the law library probably about 16 or 70 hours a week just to get up to speed. I didn't have the luxury of someone showing me how to do my work. I had to learn on my own, which I think is very valuable. Shortly thereafter, I uh, opened my own law practice again, and I was in civil litigation and you know, other areas for about 13 years. Then I became a deputy prosecutor, and that was very eye-opening. I was able to just focus my talents on a lawyer instead of being a businessman. When I returned to private practice, I started becoming involved with uh, parole revocation hearings in Los Angeles, as well as lifer hearings at the state prison. Thank you very much. I look forward to speaking to you about all issues tonight. Okay, our first, um, for the next hour or so, I'm going to be asking questions, and I'll be rotating among the candidates, and we might as well start with number one again, with um, Ms. Becton. And the first question is, 
Uh, I should mention that these, did I mention that these are, a lot of these came from the chamber itself. So these are <coughs> beginning with the business kind of questions. White collar crimes can have a devastating impact on our local businesses. Some believe that those who commit white collar crimes, such as embezzlement or fraud, are treated more leniently compared to those who steal the same amount of money or property through theft or burglary. Should so-called white collar criminals be treated differently than others who commit property theft or burglary? Why or why not? Ms. Beckman. Thank you. So first of all, to answer your question, those who are committing white collar crimes should not be treated any differently than those who commit what we sometimes refer to as more serious and violent crimes in our community. Because the white collar crimes hurt not only our business community, but they also hurt uh, individual people as well. We are very fortunate in Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office to have what's called a Special Operations Unit. And the Special Operations Unit has prosecutors that are dedicated to work on white collar crimes, including embezzlement and fraud. And in fact, if you've been following the news, you'll <laughs> see that uh, very recently we've had some significant cases that were settled uh, that involved these kinds of cases. We're also uh, engaging in uh, discussions about how we can grow that unit and what additional kinds of crimes we can take on, including uh, internet security crimes as well. So to answer the question again, no, I do not think that these crimes should be treated lightly. I think they should be prosecuted vigorously, and we will continue to do that work and continue to put the resources into the unit to take care of white collar crimes in Contra Costa County. Mr. Graves. Absolutely, they should be treated the same as any other crime, if not worse. They have a devastating impact on our community as well as the businesses, and we need to be aggressive in prosecuting them. In my 22 years, one of the things I've noticed is in prosecuting crimes with, that involve white collar crimes, one of the biggest problems is businesses not being able to do a forensic audit to determine where the crime actually is. And we do have uh, forensic accountants employed in our special operations division that we can give out to help do a forensic audit to make sure that we're holding everybody accountable who is committing theft. And that's a very, very important uh, process to undergo, and a lot of businesses can't afford to hire a forensic accountant. <laughs> Second, one thing that I've learned from going out and talking to chambers and uh, realtors and people involved in the business world over the course of this campaign is that there's a lot of stuff that maybe the prosecutors don't understand. And what I believe and what I believe we should be doing is actually having forums where we bring in people who are impacted by these. They come down to the DA's office and explain to us what they're seeing, what they're feeling in the community, and what they think's going on so that we can help them investigate crimes and we can, they can direct us to where the issues are and then we can provide our services, including our forensic accountants, to make sure that everyone is held accountable and that nobody's above the law. And Mr. Straub. I think when theft occurs, especially from a small business, it's devastating. And white collar crimes that are being committed against our small business need to be prosecuted to the maximum extent of the law. The first thing I would do is look and see what motivated that individual to commit that theft. Usually it's a crime of greed, but was there a substance abuse problem too? Because eventually that individual is gonna be going back to the community. And we don't want this person to become a career white collar criminal. So we wanna deal with them harshly, but we also wanna examine the social factors. Maybe it was substance abuse. Maybe it's a crime of greed and the person didn't have an education and trying to direct that person. Of course, every penny that that person steals from business has to be paid back. I would not treat these crimes lightly. Um, I think some of the bigger one cases we've seen, like Bernie Madoff in New York, how he stole all those pensions is just despicable. And someone like that should be going away for a long, long time. And if that's the type of theft that's occurring in this county, where it's large sums of money, then that person's gonna be going away a long, long time. Okay, question number two, let's start with you again, Mr. Strauss. Commercial burglaries have a major impact on our local businesses. They result in out-of-pocket losses and increased insurance rates. What will be your policy in prosecuting crimes where businesses are the victims? Again, being a business owner and actually experience a, experience a theft a couple months ago, I know how it feels when your, your property is taken or 
someone's stealing from you. Um, again, I believe that these cases should not be taken lightly. We have to again, treat them as every other criminal, but examine also maybe the social factors. So when this person goes back to the community, because he's gonna come back to the community at some point, we don't wanna have a career criminal on the street. So we gotta address the issues in the judicial system. What I mean by that is when a person does get his sentence and is put on probation, let's have terms of probation. No alcohol, must attend a drug treatment program, must attend a junior college to get a certificate course. Let, let's give incentives to people so they can actually make the right decisions. Thank you. And um, Ms. Becton. Commercial burglaries are crimes that have to also be taken very seriously. Um, in Contra Costa County, we have um, what we might call some of the lower level nonviolent offenses. But these kinds of crimes can also harm and hurt the businesses in Contra Costa County. And so one of the things that I'm doing right now is working uh, very closely. I have a working group that includes our law enforcement chiefs throughout the county who are represented on this committee so that we can begin to take a look at these kinds of crimes and how we might best address them in Contra Costa County. We wanna make sure that we're holding those who are committing the crimes accountable. We wanna make sure that the businesses are made whole through restitution. And we also wanna provide an opportunity for restorative justice practices as well so that the person who is committing these kinds of crimes will also have an understanding of how the community has been harmed by their behavior and an opportunity to speak directly with the victims of crime if the victim so chooses to have that conversation. So we're working on a holistic approach so that we're holding people accountable, but we're also uh, making sure that those who are the victims of crime are made whole. Uh, can I rebuttal? Or are we doing rebuttal? Um, why don't we wait for Mr. Graves and then you can do the rebuttal. Mr. Graves. Burglaries, including commercial burglaries, have been on the rise. Property crimes are on the rise. And we need to have proactive solutions to address these. It's one thing to talk in generalities that, yes, I'm going to be tough on commercial burglaries, but what does that mean for your actual businesses here? How are you going to do that? How does the small business that can't afford to put a camera up in front of the store actually keep from getting burglarized over and over and over again? So that's where your DA's office really needs to lead. We need to be working with the community and looking at crime trends and crime strategies and using our Safe Streets Task Force to come up with proactive solutions to maybe loan a camera if we know a certain area is being hit over and over again in burglaries to find out who's responsible and get to the bottom of it. That's what I believe a district attorney's office is supposed to do. I don't like sitting in my office just reading cases and reading police reports. I like to get out in the community and look for solutions on how we can be proactive and how we can actually do things to stop crime from occurring before it happens and before we have victims. And along those lines, I've shown time and time again in the course of my career a variety of proactive approaches to crime. And that's the approach I would take when it comes to commercial burglaries, and I would offer the services of our office to make sure that happens. Okay, a rebuttal with yes. 60 seconds for Mr. Yes. Strauss. Thank you. You know, they say past actions of predictor of future behavior, but when Diane Becton was a judge, did she put into policy these principles when she was formulating sentences with clients? I had one case in front of Ms. Becton. My client needed a program. She didn't order restorative justice. She didn't order a program for my client. She sentenced my client to 60 days. So I think what the audience needs to do is review Ms. Becton's record as a judge. See what she was doing as a judge if she was playing the same tune when she was on the bench because past actions are predictive of future behavior. Thank you. Okay, the next question, uh, we'll start with Mr. Graves. The rapid rise in Bay Area home prices seems to have created a greater problem with homelessness. At the same time, homelessness has a negative impact on local businesses. As district attorney, how will you address the growing problem of homelessness in Contra Costa County? Well, that's one of those questions. It's always a very good question. And unfortunately, day in and day out, I see the impact of homelessness on our community and on our businesses. And the vast majority of our homeless population 
also have mental health problems. And I've been talking since last year when we started these forums about having a united approach in our county to taking care of some of these issues and addressing the homeless population with mental health issues and actually working on our mental health diversion program, expanding our mental health care court, and actually having a mental health center patterned after our family justice center where people with issues that uh, commit crimes and are in our community whether it's indecent exposure, whether it's drugs, but they have mental health issues, the police can actually take them, take them to one-stop shopping where they can get the psychological services they need, the drug services they need, uh, temporary shelter, home placement, job skills, job training, education. That's really important to get to the root of the homeless problem. Too often what happens is they commit a misdemeanor offense, they come into court, they get released, their attorney won't put them into a mental health diversion because it's too restrictive and they know they might not pass through it. And so they just let them back out on the street and they're a continual problem. We're not doing a service to that population by doing that or acting that way. What we need to do is make sure that we can divert people who need services into the mental health services that can offer all the things that I've described. And that is how you have to take care of the homeless problem. Mr. Strauss. Because homelessness is a problem, especially in our society, the cost of living is so expensive in the Bay Area. But what I would do is I would make sure when our police officers are on the street that there's a social worker with them. So when they find someone who's homeless on the street, they could check right there. We shouldn't have to drag someone into the judicial service system to give them services. That's absolutely ridiculous. So I would instruct all our local police to go out there and be active in talking and dealing with the issue rather than waiting and trying to put a Band-Aid solution through the court system. Um, also, what we need to do is we need to make sure that the homeless have a safe area to sleep at night because it's, it's very violent out there. So maybe a local church, I know my church is active in a winter nights program, could give them the uh, ability to sleep in the parking lot so it's nice and safe and they don't have to worry. Um, we cannot have homelessness, though, in downtown Pittsburgh because it is a business community. So what I would do is try to just make sure that there's a, an area more dedicated for them. So that way, at least, it won't be interfering with the business shops and other uh, providers in the downtown areas. Thank you. And Ms. Becton. So this is another area where I'm pleased to report that we've already taken the lead to begin these discussions and find the solutions. Uh, just within the past 30 days, I've met with our police chiefs and city managers from Central County. I've had a similar meeting with the chiefs out in East County. And the chiefs in uh, West County are meeting as well. We're identifying the problems that each area of our county sees with respect to these issues. Our next step is to bring to the table all of our criminal justice partners because we're recognizing that there has to be a holistic approach to solving the problem. So I am in the process of convening a countywide task force that is going to work on the three issues that really come up all the time. The mental health, the homelessness, and the drug addiction. And that's why we need a holistic approach to, to this, these problems because it's going to take all of us working together as a community to solve them. So that work is already underway and we've already identified some programs um, such as in Antioch we um, have a program that's going to be launching within the next month called COCO Lead and it is going to be a pilot or a test uh, for our county to see how diverting cases away from our system and into services can work in a small part of our community, and then we can duplicate that, those efforts in other parts of the county as well. Okay, sticking with Ms. Becton, this is a question from our audience here at Los Mandados College. Is there a place for the DA's office in the, present, in the prevention of bullying in schools? Yeah, is there a place for the DA's office in the prevention of bullying in schools? Okay, I, I think there's absolutely a place in the district attorney's office to lend its voice to the issues that are affecting our schools. Um, just this um, past uh, couple of weeks, we sent out a letter to all of the elementary schools, starting there with phase one, all of the principals within the county letting all of the schools know that the district attorney's office is interested in coming 
Um, I've been, uh, been invited personally to come. The invitations are starting already. It's going to be working on a couple of issues. One has to do with our anti-truancy work, but also we'll send out speakers to the schools on issues like gun safety, bullying, and any other topics that the community feels are relevant for us to have a, lend our voice to. And so absolutely, we're willing to do that kind of work, and we've already started those efforts by reaching out directly to our schools. Mr. Grays. I'm pleased to announce Laura Delahunt has been working on this program for years. She's our truancy DA. She's been doing truancy, and she has an anti-bullying program outreach into schools, and she's been doing that and getting into the schools. I'm a big believer in having a DA's office that's out in the community. In fact, today I spent two class periods teaching sexual assault awareness and intervention to a high school, and I'm going to be back doing it again tomorrow. I started this when I took over the sexual assault unit. Um, I thought it was very important to get to our youth, and so I've been in multiple high schools this year. And I also started a internet safety and internet anti-bullying program that we take to the middle schools. And those programs, uh, we do one for the parents, a parent presentation on how to protect your kids' safety, and also uh, what we're going to be telling the children. And then we actually do a presentation for the school as well. And I have several dedicated individuals in my unit that will go out and do that. So yes, an anti-bullying program is in place. It needs to expand. And Laura Delahunt can't do everything alone. And I'd like to see every school taking advantage of the free services and what the people in the district attorney's office are prepared to do in all of these issues. And Mr. Strauss. Well, that's funny you say, you say there's an anti-bullying program in place, because my daughter at Arita Intermediate School was bullied by her classmates. We went to the principal, we couldn't be helped, and she had a miserable eighth grade year. In fact, it was so bad that she didn't even go to her home school of Marimani, she transferred to Camp Olindo, so she didn't have to see the bullies. So they're talking about this program, and again, actions speak louder than words. There is no program that I'm aware of that the DA's office has. Now, when I was a deputy prosecutor, my first assignment was in juvenile court. It was called the family courts, and as a deputy prosecutor, a lower level prosecutors, I actually went to the high schools to talk to the principals, to talk to the schools. I did that as a line deputy, not the supervisor, not the official elected DA, but as a line deputy. So how come the line deputies in Contra Costa County are not going out visiting the schools? Because they deal with these kids in the juvenile courtrooms in Walnut Creek and also at Juvenile Hall. So I'm wondering, they talk about these programs, but yet actions speak louder than words. And there is no program that I'm aware of. Thank you. OK, this uh, next question, uh, we'll start with Mr. Graves. California law makes it a crime for people to perform certain construction jobs without a contractor's license or for failing to carry workers' compensation insurance. Would you devote resources to prosecute these sorts of crimes? Absolutely. Uh, an office under my leadership would be concerned with any sort of criminal violation. This is another example of our special operations division. Uh, we already have a special operations division, but they could do more and they could expand in this area. It's another example, too, of where people who are affected by this and who actually are working in construction and know about this going on, they should have an opportunity to come down to a district attorney's office that has an open door make the report to us, and we can assist with the investigation to hold people accountable. It is my position that anybody who violates the law should at least be investigated and held accountable. So yes, it is something that my office would be very active in investigating and assisting. Mr. Strauss? Well, I do want to give them credit because they do have this special force because I represented one of these unlicensed, unlicensed contractors. I'm with the conflict panel, which is like the public defender's office in Contra Costa, so I get these assignments. And what is, it's a unit from Sacramento, and they set up a sting. Usually they do a Craigslist advertisement to try to get people to come in and bid on these jobs, and then they nab a bunch of contractors. So there is a, a program I know in this county for unlicensed contractors. Uh, can it be expanded? Yes, probably. I'm sure that Sacramento is not dedicating enough resources to our county. I'm sure that this goes on all the time. If you just go on Craigslist, you'll see these solicitations and ads for services, home improvement services. And if the service, I think, is more than like two or $400, they need a contractor's license. So you'll see, for example, in my case, it was a guy who was doing landscaping and he was building fences. Well, the building the fences requires a contractor's license that my client didn't have. The case was resolved. Um, I think he had to do some community service pay some fines, and also he was encouraged to get his contractor's license, which I believe he ultimately did. Thank you. 
And Ms. Becton. Um, yes, we will continue to prosecute um, crimes, uh, even if they are involved, uh, crimes that are involved on the construction work site. We do have our special operations unit, as you've already heard mentioned. We have prosecutors in our office who specialize in this type of work. We will continue to devote the resources um, to uh, cases that involve construction and that involve labor. We're also making sure that we're having conversations with our labor community so that uh, the labor community can tell us what is important to them as well. Solving crimes and making our community safer is a two-way street. So this gives us an opportunity to hear directly from those who are affected by these kinds of crimes and making sure that our office is responsive to the needs of our community. Okay, this question is from our Facebook audience and we'll start with Mr. Strauss. In your given profession, what have you done to ensure equal justice for all? And what visible programs would you put in place to demonstrate equality? Well, I've done both sides of this issue uh, as a deputy prosecutor and as a defense attorney. I think some of, one of the most memorable cases I have for equal justice for all was I was in Los Angeles and I had an African American client who was being harassed by the police department. And they cited the client, he was on uh, public, he was on his own private property in a garage, and they cited for loitering. And it was a parole violation for loitering. And I fought that case tooth and nail because he was on his private property. He had the right to be there. And he looked at me and he said, um, he's a young man, and I go, you know what you need to do? You need to file a complaint with the police commission because this is not tolerable in a civilized society to sit there and target minorities who are just hanging out on their own property. So uh, that was one of the most rewarding cases I had uh, in my history of uh, handling uh, parole violations, uh, life or parole hearings, and criminal defense. Ms. Becton? I think the question was directed to our careers. So I will start out uh, with the time that I spent as a judge. Because I think it was a very important opportunity when you're touching the, so many different people in the courtroom. As a judge and you're presiding over a trial, you have an opportunity to observe what's happening, both from the prosecutor, the uh, defense side with the defendant, the victims in the courtroom, the jurors, everyone is really under your supervision. And so one of the things as a judge that is so important is to make sure that every single person who steps into that courtroom knows that they're going to be treated with fairness and be treated with dignity and respect. As a prosecutor and as the district attorney in Contra Costa County, um, there are several things that we're doing in that respect. One has to do with the training. Um, all of our new attorneys, uh, when we held our uh, training uh, for the new attorneys starting in our office this past, uh, this past uh, September it was, we made sure that um, bias training was included as part of the training for our newer prosecutors. We've also establishing a conviction integrity unit so that we have an opportunity to review any cases where people feel that they've been treated unfairly. And then finally, I make sure that uh, when people want to speak with me directly about particular cases, um, that they have an opportunity to do that as well. And Mr. Graves. For the last 22 plus years, I've served this community uh, trying to do my best. Nobody's perfect, but I believe that I have executed my duties without regard to race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or gender. And I firmly believe that's the way the office should be. We should not file a case unless we believe we can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. We should take all factors into consideration in working on a disposition, and we should make sure that every disposition is fair based on the facts of the case and the background of the individual involved, and that nobody's getting preferential treatment. You know, when I do the training for our new attorneys, and when I talk to law enforcement officers at the academy and I train them, I tell them this. Every victim, witness, and defendant you come in contact with in the course of your career is an opportunity to change a life. And I firmly believe that. And I firmly believe we have to listen, give everybody a chance, and treat everybody fairly. Okay, this next question, uh, we'll start with Ms. Becton. 
What will be your policy concerning cooperation with federal immigration officials regarding persons who have been convicted of violent felonies, felony domestic violence, and sex crimes? This question is specifically directed to immigration enforcement concerning the perpetrators of crimes, not witnesses or victims. Thank you. So I, I believe the question is really asking whether or not we be um, carrying out any policies from our office to uh, be involved in federal immigration uh, enforcement. And the answer is no, we will not. Um, the, that job, I think, is left to those who work in federal enforcement. Our job is to make sure here that victims of crime are kept safe and that those who perpetrate crimes in our community are held accountable to the fullest extent of the law. But there's nothing within the policies in our office where we will be cooperating with ICE. I think this is an also, also an opportunity to make sure that I mention that as a prosecutor, I've signed on to a couple of amicus briefs, one having to do with um, um, asking the court to keep in place the protections for DACA. I know that this is a, a, a question that really talks about the defendants, but I wanted to highlight that as well. And then also making sure that um, there's another case that I've signed on to to lend my voice to make sure that we are not uh, forced to use our local law enforcement resources, which we need here to continue to build trust and confidence with our community in order to have them uh, forced to cooperate with ICE at the risk of losing the funding that we get for our local police officers. And so I do not intend to cooperate in any way with um, ICE officials. Mr. Graves. So this question was directed specifically at defendants. And in, in terms of our office's involvement with ICE at the early stages, I can tell you when I review a case, I review every sexual assault case that occurs in this county. I've also reviewed every homicide case that's re uh, occurred in this county when I've had a homicide. When we're reviewing a case, 99% of the time, we do not know the person whose case we're reviewing as a defendant is undocumented or not. We're reviewing the case based on the facts and deciding whether or not we can file a case. Once that determination is made, if we do not file a case, there's no need to cooperate with ICE or talk to ICE about it because we don't have a case. That's up to law enforcement, the person's in their custody, and that's how they deal with it and how they deal with it is their prerogative. Once a case is filed, however, and we've charged a serious crime, like a violent crime, a sex offense, or a murder, where it comes into play for our office is we're obligated under the law to factor in immigration consequences when negotiating a plea disposition. And I can assure you that's a very difficult thing to do when somebody's been molested as a child and you're going to go to them and say, I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to have them plead to a misdemeanor battery so that they don't get deported. Uh, I can't do that to a small child. I can't. That's not justice. So once we have entered into a plea disposition or somebody's been convicted, those crimes make them eligible to be deported, but that is not something our office takes part in or does. It's just a qualifying offense and it's a matter of public record. So when they've been convicted, at that point, the federal authorities then could take whatever actions they want. That's the extent of our office's involvement. And Mr. Strauss. Well, I, I'm kind of shocked because I don't hear the two words that I would say right away, stay prison. Um, you got a sex offender? Are you kidding me? You're going to even think about the consequences of the plea of a sex offender? I deal with these people in my life of parole hearings. I deal with sex offenders, murder to, rape, robbery, really violent crimes. And some of them do have immigration holds on their record. And I know after they get released from prison, ICE is going to pick them up. Um, th there's no doubt in my mind. What I would do is I would charge them, and I would put them in state prison, where the immigration hold would be slapped on them. And then ICE would pick them up. I wouldn't even consider it. I, I, I'm kind of astounded I haven't heard that from my two colleagues here. Maybe they haven't done enough work with the prison system to realize that these holds are placed on them, and they're going nowhere. Um, I have no sympathy, no sympathy whatsoever for violent criminals. These people need to be taken off the street, period. They need to go to state prison, period. There, there's, there's no redemption when someone is brutalizing a seven-year-old. I've seen sex offenders, a 12-year-old, someone's stepdaughter. It is the most disgusting, despicable, low-life conduct, and there's no way I would even consider a moment the immigration consequences. It would be state prison for all those criminals. Thank you. 
Okay, this is a question from the audience, which is related, uh, starting with Mr. Graves. What will you do to develop trust between law enforcement and the immigrant community? Now, that is a question that the DA's office can definitely lead on. As somebody who's been in charge of the sexual assault unit, I can tell you we have a vested interest as a community in having an environment with the DA's office as well as with law enforcement to encourage victims and witnesses to come forward and report crimes. Absolutely. Uh, we need to continue to build that trust. And I can tell you, whether or not we file a case, it's still our obligation, if somebody has the courage to find their voice and come forward, to do something about it. Now, I had a case It was a teacher with about uh, five victims that we could not file because it would, did not rise to the level of a crime, but it was still uh, victims who came forward. And I spent an afternoon with their immigration lawyer and with them explaining to them how they can apply for a U visa and how they can go through the process and making sure that they had the access to get the police reports that they would need to do that. And working together with law enforcement, we do that day in and day out in our office, is helping people get their visas and help them feel comfortable coming forward. And I even spoke at the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I did a webinar, and I was on there with another individual talking about immigration fraud and immigration lawyer fraud and immigration consultant fraud. But my main reason to be there was to get the word out to the community also to assure them it is okay to come to the DA's office. We are here for you, and if you are a victim or a witness in a case, we will help you. We want you to come forward. We need you to come forward for the safety of our community and for the safety of everybody in our community, including those who are undocumented. Um, I'm lost here. Mr. Strauss. It, it's, uh, the immigrant community, and a lot of citizens too, don't trust law enforcement anymore. There's been a breach of trust. There's been police shootings. There, there's been citizens just with no unarmed being shot. So we have to repair this trust. What I would do as DA is I would go into the communities. Um, go. I'm, I speak some Spanish, I'm not totally fluent, but I would try to present myself as best I can in their native language. I would also have, if we have on staff, Spanish speaking deputies to go in and speak to the community to tell them it's important that we're gonna take care of you. You don't have to fear being deported to come forward with a crime. There are immigrant visas that can be given to victims of crime, and that will help them at least with their residency. And I think that that process should be began at the initial reporting. That should be told to the victim that, hey, there's an immigrant visa, and we're going to help you with the paperwork. We're going to direct you to low cost legal aid services, and we're going to provide you everything from our office so you feel like you, you could talk about this crime and not be threatened to be deported back to your country, breaking up the family. If you see what's going on with this country and how families are just being torn apart, it's horrendous. So building trust is gonna take time. It's not an overnight process, but I think the best way is to actually go in to these communities and talk to everyone. And Ms. Becton. The first thing that I've done already to begin to have this conversation is to convene a forum in Sacramento so that at a legislative level, we could talk about whether or not there were things that we needed to do from that standpoint in order to keep Im our immigrant communities safe uh, when they are victims of crime. And one of the things that was brought out at that forum, and this actually came from a law enforcement chief, um, was that people have to feel that they can trust our institutions. And that's where we all come in. That's why it's important for me as the district attorney to be in the community and making sure that, for example, when there was a forum here in this very room on immigration, that I was here and speaking to those who are most affected by um, decisions um, that might um, affect whether or not a person feels that they can trust our coming into our office. And to make sure that our community knows that if you're a victim of crime, that you are going to be treated fairly by our office and that we are going to take your case seriously and we're not going to be worried about what your status is in terms of being an immigrant or not. We also wanna make sure that our community is aware that our governor just signed into effect a law that says that when you are testifying in court that you can't be asked about immigration status because that's simply not relevant. And then making sure that we have the proper training for you visas in our office as well. 
Okay, this is a two-part question. The first part is from uh, someone in the audience. How do you plan to remain objective when it comes to prosecuting officers who kill people of color while performing their duties? And the second part is, do you believe that the public would be better served by having a civilian-led independent agency conduct these investigations, like in San Jose, Oakland, and BART? Um, Mr. Strauss. Well, I'm gonna answer part two first about the civilian agency. I think that's absolutely essential. What happens when you're in the district attorney's office is you work with these officers. You're, you're friends with them. They're, you see them case in, case out. Mr. Graves has a lot of money being donated him by police agencies, all right? So I think that money and these relationships, your judgment is gonna be clouded. You're gonna try to be more soft. You're gonna try to say, oh, he didn't do it. He didn't mean to do it. No, the DA has to remove himself from that situation and let a civilian agency go ahead and be the leading investigatory agency. Even to prosecute the case, I would refer to a state attorney general or I would refer it to another uh, county because again of the relationships between the DA's office and the, um, the law enforcement agencies. As to the first part of the question, when, an, when a police officer shoots a person, uh, that's, there's, it's horrible. First of all, they should be trained. There should never be any of these casualties. But I would treat that individual just like any other criminal. I wouldn't give special status to the police officer just because he shot someone. He would be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Um, Mr. Graves. Mr. Strauss has not known me for 22 years. I can assure you that the reason law enforcement uh, backs me and supports me is because they know I'll do the right thing. And the fine men and women who actually work in those agencies, they don't want people who commit crimes working for them either. I can guarantee you that. I can remain objective. I believe what we need to do is make sure that we are ethically reviewing charges, and if we can file charges and prove them beyond a reasonable doubt, nobody's above the law, and I absolutely would prosecute them, and I have before. I have filed cases on law enforcement officers. It is not a problem to me at all. Because if you violate the law and you're a sworn peace officer, you deserve to be held accountable. When it comes to a uh, civilian-led agency investigating these, our officer-involved shooting protocol is considered the gold standard in the state. Other agencies follow us and look to us from all these other counties that have been mentioned. We have a coroner's inquest, which does serve a purpose of having an independent body review all of the evidence. And to me, one of the most important things when we do one of these uh, investigations is to make sure that we're being as tra transparent as possible and also communicating with the community as to why a decision was made. Somebody who loses a loved one, whether or not a case can be filed, at least deserves to know the reason why a case couldn't be filed. And I've done that numerous times in my career where I've sat down with people who have had victims of different types of crimes and explained to the victim and their family why a case couldn't be prosecuted. I know not everybody's going to agree with every decision we make, but they deserve to at least understand why it's being made. And Ms. Becton. I think the two most important issues when it comes to officer-involved shootings is, would be accountability and transparency. So if you have a person who is harming someone in our community, it really doesn't matter what your status is. You have to be held accountable if you are incorrectly or inappropriately harming citizens of our county. So if there is an officer involved shooting, then we need to make sure that we are reviewing that case just as we would any other and filing charges when appropriate. We do have a protocol in place in Contra Costa County in agreement with our law enforcement chiefs as well. And that protocol does call for an, uh, an investigator from our office to go out alongside the agency that is investigating so that we can take an independent look at the evidence as well. That report is then made to me and I ultimately, of course, will have the final decision as to whether or not the charges are fall, filed. The transparency comes in though because we are going to take our protocol to a, an additional step, and that is to make sure that my decisions, when there is a fatality, will be um, not only done in writing, but will be released to the public and available uh, on our website so that I can be held accountable to our community as well. 
And then finally, whenever a uh, family has lost a loved one, they have an opportunity to meet personally with me as well. I have a rebuttal. Yes, your second rebuttal. Thank you. Um, you might be aware of this case where a deputy in Contra Costa County was charged with inappropriate sexual conduct with some of the inmates. The day that deputy was charged, there was a donation from one of Mr. Graves' supporting police agency. What's also interesting to note about that case, I want to bring it to the public's attention, is he's the sexual assault head, yet the case wasn't given to Mr. Graves to prosecute. Now these questions haven't been answered by Ms. Becton, who is the presiding district attorney of the office, or Mr. Graves. Just something I want the audience and the people on video to think about. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, let, oh, <laughs> let's start with uh, Ms. Becton. 49er linebacker Reuben Foster was accused by his girlfriend of domestic violence. She has recently recanted her testimony. What will be your policy in domestic violence cases when the victim recants? How far will you go to compel a victim to testify when they don't want to? Oh, you, yeah. So, having in a domestic violence case, it is very common to have a victim who recants, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. Because a domestic violence case has so many different dynamics involved in it. Of course, there's the relationship between the people. Very often, um, the uh, person who's perpetrating the violence is maybe the breadwinner and, and those kinds of things. So the first thing that we want to do is to make sure that the victim has a victim advocate assigned to their case, that they're supported throughout the process, and that they know that our office is there for them throughout the case. But when a person uh, recants their testimony, we will then have to look at the entire case, all of the evidence that is available to us, to see if we can go forward with that case without their testimony. And there have been numerous cases where we're able to still prosecute a case, even though we don't have the uh, testimony of the victim. I think what the person is probably asking us is whether or not we would also um, cause the uh, witness to be um, jailed if they are not, um, or would ask the, the judge to have that witness jailed if they're not forthcoming in their testimony. And I think that we would not want to go forward in most cases with re-victimizing people by having them placed in jail when they refuse to testify. Mr. Graves. When I heard that question, I kind of felt like saying, welcome to my world. As the head of the sexual assault unit, domestic violence unit, elder abuse unit, this is something we see day in and day out. Um, no, we would not put somebody in custody because legally we can't if they refuse to testify. So we wouldn't do that. But this is a good example of several things I've been talking about. Training law enforcement officers on how to properly investigate these cases so that instead of looking back in hindsight to see if we can prove the case without the victim recanting, we assume the victim is going to recant. And we make sure the officers know how to investigate the case on the front end so that when that recantation occurs, we already still have a viable case and we can move forward. Because let's face it, whether they recant or not, a vast majority of our domestic violence victims unfortunately end up being a statistic if we cannot intervene and we cannot prosecute. It also is a perfect example of why I've been advocating for a domestic violence misdemeanor unit in our office, which we don't have. Having cases pre-assigned to an attorney early on so that they can get that immediate interaction with a victim. I can tell you the best success we have is when the DA and the victim witness advocate can get together with that victim and law enforcement almost immediately after the case is brought to us and they can talk through these issues and build that trust and confidence. But to me, whether it's a misdemeanor domestic violence or a felony domestic violence case, both are equally likely to be a statistic and it's our obligation as a district attorney's office and as prosecutors to do everything we can to help misdemeanor victims as well as felony victims. And Mr. Strauss. Well, the first thing I would make sure is all my police officers were equi equipped with body cameras. That's when they go out to the call, they click on the video, and the victim will tell them what happened. He hit me, he beat me. There's pictures, there's evidence, and that testimony is now locked down. 
not just having an officer write in a report because there, there could be a doubt. It could raise doubt in front of a jury. But if you have the actual video of the victim talking to law enforcement, showing her where she was hit, showing them the scene. Here's the, the scene. Look at the bedroom. Everything's scattered off. Even if the person recants, you already got the evidence. So I think we need to have more of a front-end solution rather than the bandied approach that the district attorney seems to have on some of these issues. Um, what I would do is I would educate the victim, though, about the cycle abuse of domestic violence and the power and control issues. Because the victim, once you start talking to somebody and you're explaining the cycle of violence, which is the honeymoon stage, then the tension or build up, and then the verbal, physical, emotional, or financial abuse, and then they come back to try to make up again for the honeymoon stage. Once a victim learns this and starts understanding domestic violence, a light comes on. Yeah, that's happened to me. Thank you. Okay, this is a question uh, that came from the audience and also from an online submittal. And we'll start with Mr. Graves. What improvements in policy and procedure do you want to implement in the DA's office? If elected, what would be the biggest change you would bring to the district attorney's office? For 90 seconds, that's a tough one. Uh, but one thing that I will say that I've been talking about, I think the biggest problem we have right now is in the administration of justice and how long it takes for a case to get through uh, the system. For a regular misdemeanor case, it's at least a year. And for felony cases, it can be upwards of three years. And I still remember when I first became a prosecutor assigned to the sexual assault unit, there was a young lady who, she was 13 years old and reported a sexual assault. The case was filed when she was 13. When I came into the unit and the case was assigned to me after being in the hand of a couple other DAs, she was two months away from turning 18. That's inexcusable. That cannot happen. And so one of the biggest changes I would do is transform the office into what I consider to be a more victim-centered approach, where we restructure the office based on the new needs we have, on some of the new laws we have, and look at areas where we can reallocate resources so we're getting more cases in the hands of DAs so that they can have it from the time of filing through prosecution so we can do a better job of holding people accountable and getting cases through the system. To me, that's one of the biggest changes that we can make to help with the criminal justice system and to help serve our victims of crime. And so that's what I seek to do. And it can be done. It just is going to take a little bit of work. Mr. Strauss. Well, the main thing is the administrative justice. And this is a danger to the public. I'm going to give you an example. I've handled a case where a guy was cited for uh, domestic disturbance. He goes to court 60 days later. The case isn't filed. He walks away. 11 months, they decide to file their case. Meanwhile, he's on the street. And this applies to other cases, too, theft, DUI. Most, mostly misdemeanors. And the reason why it's happening is because they're not efficient in their work. By that, they only have a certain amount of screening deputies, but they have a lot of bodies in the DA's office. They have supervisors. They have the pro-lifer unit, my counterpart. Instead of sending this guy four hours to Corcoran, four hours back, paying for his overnight trips there, his food, he could be a Martinez doing this on conference call or on video. They don't have to appear in the prisons. That one position alone is a clerk one attorney, and I think there's another retired attorney, it has to be at least $150,000, $200,000 of just wasted money, wasted taxpayer funds. Those resources could go in to making sure the cases are being timely filed. Another thing they do inefficiently is pretrial conferences. They will not give a, de a defense attorney an offer until you go to court, so people are standing around in court for about two hours waiting for their attorneys to talk to the judge to get the offer. There's got to be some fundamental changes, and I'm the person to make those changes. And Ms. Becton. Earlier, Mr. Strauss mentioned that um, I, he'd not seen me refer anyone to a restorative justice program. And you're correct, and that's because we've never had anyone in Contra Costa County take the leadership role to bring and develop these kinds of programs for our county. So my approach in terms of this three main things that I'd like to accomplish. One has to first do with our juveniles. We have a system where we've got 9% of the um, population in terms of African Americans in our county, but we have over 41% African Americans represented in our juvenile justice system. The juvenile justice system uh, needs to change so that we can provide some better options for our youth 
and that we can break that pipeline or disrupt that pipeline that leads our kids from school to prison. So that is the first place where I'm taking a leadership role so that we can provide additional alternatives for our young people other than uh, criminalization. The other big project is the misdemeanor cases that come through our system. Uh, we simply have, uh, are using too much of our resources uh, in our office as well as law enforcement and we are working together now with our chiefs to find those alternatives. And the third, of course, is with our mental health community to make sure that we have alternatives other than criminalizing everyone who comes into our criminal justice system with mental health problems. Um, I think we're finished on that one, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, this question, um, let's see. I kind of lost my place. Um, this is an audience question. <clears throat> uh, and the first question will go to Mr. Graves. In some communities, we are seeing a school to prison pipeline. Is there a place for the DA's office at the educational level to disrupt this pipeline? And, and the answer is absolutely. I've been talking about this since last year, forum after forum, is when you look at the school to prison pipeline, there's a lot that we can do. Uh, number one, it's in the way we deal with juvenile crimes and how we handle juvenile crimes and talking about finding ways unique to that individual to help get them out of the system. One thing I do know uh, from all my years and from and looking at statistics, statistically speaking, if people aren't reading at grade level by the third grade, they are not going to graduate high school. If they don't graduate high school, 85% of our state prison population are people who did not graduate high school. So anything proactive that the DA's office can do to get in the schools early and often and encourage reading, uh, encourage anti-truancy, and to actually work with anybody who violates the law, understanding where they come from, and actually come up with a creative sentence that will incorporate all the things that we need to get them the education and get them back in school so that we can end the uh, juvenile to prison pipeline for sure. And so these are things that I'm very active with, and I think I've already mentioned all the stuff that I've already been doing in the schools, and I would love to be more and more active in the schools in this regard. Uh, Mr. Strauss. We need to bring programs to schools. You know, one of the most powerful moments I've had was I was in a parole hearing, and the brother of the murder victim attended the parole hearing, and he went through a restorative justice program, and he's willing to forgive the defendant. I spoke to him and said, would you be willing to go out in the community with the defendant once he gets re released to prison and tell your story and share your story, share what that loss was for you? And I spoke to the defendant too. Can you tell, talk to people, talk to the children, explain how what you did going into juvenile crimes and where it led and how you spent 30 years in a state prison. See, a guy with a suit could go into the school, but we don't have that street credibility with these kids. Um, I've never committed any crimes, but if you bring in a victim of crime and a criminal and you start educating our students, hey, if you don't go to school, hey, if you, you, you start choosing a life of crime, this is where it's going to end up. It's going to end up in state prison. And every inmate I've spoken to who I've represented is more than willing to volunteer for this type of program. In fact, I made a video that's on my website of, of what I want to do and get these programs involved in our schools, all the way up, not only in the middle schools, but all the way up to junior college. Thank you. Ms. Becton. Well, I think first of all, the things that we're already doing will continue to put resources in, such as our anti-truancy court, which has been a great place um, because we've taken a different approach there and that's a holistic approach. We now have partnered not only with our schools but with other community-based organizations so that when we have a child who's not in school, we try to get right to the root of the problem and give the resources to the entire family so that we can uh, get that child in school and back on track. The other thing I've already mentioned, which was uh, sending letters out from our office to every elementary school principal in our county to make sure that all of the schools know that the district attorney's office is available to uh, come out to the schools to, to talk about the importance of keeping our young people in school and to bring to them the tools that are needed to, from our office to assist with anti-truancy. 
But I'm also working on some other things that I think are just as important, and that is um, the meetings that we're holding with those agencies that are going to help us to bring diversion programs and restorative justice programs for our young people. We're also working closely with uh, the Vera Institute to work on programs just for our girls to find out what brings them uh, into the criminal justice system and taking them away from our schools so that we can begin to work on solutions for them as well. Okay, this is our last question before your closing statements. And this is from Facebook, and um, we will start with Ms. Becton. What will you do to make sure the victims have a say-so in any deals that are made with regard to their cases? Well, we are required uh, by law to make sure that the victims of crime are included in our dispositions so that they have a voice, they have a say-so, and we um, listen to their wants and their desires when we're crafting a settlement or a disposition of a case. They need to have an opportunity also to be informed when cases are on calendar so that they have an opportunity to be in court and to be heard and to speak out. We also have our Victims Advocate Unit um, that is a very, very robust unit. We assign an advocate to a victim at the outset of the case so that we have a person that works directly with the victim of crime and supports them throughout what can be a very difficult and arduous process as the cases are going through courts and through the plea bargaining process if that is the appropriate avenue. So we will continue to put those resources into caring for our victims, making sure that our attorneys are trained to know that when they are uh, thinking about settling a case, that they are including the victim in those discussions and taking into account their concerns and making sure that we also put in place uh, and demand the appropriate protections for victims as well. Mr. Graves? In my opinion, every case that comes through our office with a victim is more their case than it is ours. Absolutely. And so instead of talking in theories or what I would do, I'll tell you what I do in my unit, what I insist on in my unit. When somebody comes in and the defense attorney comes in to negotiate a case, I will not make a final offer. I discuss, I hear where they are, and then I have the attorney who's had a relationship with the victim of sexual assault actually call them up, meet with the family, and answer any questions and tell them why this is the offer, what I'm considering, and I take their input before I finalize any offer. I think it's very, very important. If there's issues with the case or if there's a reason that we need to resolve the case and the family doesn't understand it, I invite them down to the office and I will sit there with the assigned attorney, even as a supervisor, and I'll put up a whiteboard in our, we have a whiteboard in our office, and I will sit there and I'll explain to them what all the sentencing options are, what the realistic probabilities are, and why we're doing what we're doing. Because to me, we're supposed to serve the public. We're supposed to serve victims of crime. And so yes, even though Marcy's Law obligates us to do it, I would do it regardless of Marcy's Law. This is their case, this is their life, it impacted them and they deserve to know and at least have a say in what the sentence is. And I tell all of them, if you don't agree with me, you can go to sentencing and we have them go to the sentencing hearing and I say, go ahead and, and tell the judge that you don't agree with us and we'll go to trial on the case. Uh, most of the time they end up understanding and they know why we're there, but it is an option and they should be aware of that. They are not beholden to the district attorney on the case. They can actually go object to the judge at any sentence that is imposed. And Mr. Strauss. Well, I think it's nice that the leadership has that position, but when you look at the line deputies, I don't really see that, and I, I'm in and out of court probably every other week or so. Um, what I would do is first off, I would make sure that every DA's office has a victim's memorial, and I want these dedicated so every deputy that walks out of my office sees this victim's memorial on the way to court, that they have that victim in mind, because really, the victim of crime is the reason why there's a, a court trial or, or, or a jury trial. Um, what I would do too is the victims are allowed to give an impact statement. Again, I rarely see it in my cases with the line deputies, so I don't know if they're dropping the ball because I rarely see impact statements being uh, uh, read to the judge or at least the, uh, the sentencing uh, hearings. So I would make sure that when a case is filed, the, vi the victims know the case is filed. Give them notice of the court proceedings. Get their email address. 
with electronic calendaring, it's not too hard to put in court dates and notify the people so they know that the case is being prosecuted to get their input on the sentencing. I wouldn't let their input dictate my offer, but I would listen. That's what I do. I reach more out to victims to make sure that their interests are at least stated. Okay, we are now done with the questions, and I know I didn't get to everybody's question, so maybe the candidates will stay after, and you can ask them a question if you didn't get yours answer, asked and answered. Um, but we are now at the concluding remarks, and um, each candidate will have two minutes for their closing, and we'll go in reverse order, which means that Mr. Strauss f starts. You know, I've been in this business for 26 years, and I didn't always wear the hat of prosecutor. And the problem is when you're just doing one side, prosecution, 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 you see the trees, but you really don't see the forest. You don't see the causes of criminality. You don't see the real roots of criminality. Also, being involved in civil litigation for 13 years prior to actually going into criminal law, I understand the issues that businesses have. I understand that time, money, and efficiency and that's how we need to run this office. Time, money, and efficiency. We don't have the public come down to court and wait for two and a half hours for a judge and a DA and a defense attorney to get an offer on a case. That's a big waste of time. We don't have a deputy DA driving all the way down to Corcoran, California, spending four hours on the road there, four hours back, spending another $120 in the hotel. When these hearings, which I attend, can be all done by telephone or video conferencing. Again, time, money, and efficiency. You know, I, I appreciate the social issues, but for me, that's not the reason why I, I started my, my goal of going to uh, become a district attorney. It's I'm sitting in court, and I'm just seeing this seething. Because when you look out in the court halls and you see 100 people standing around waiting, something has to be done. And I was taught, when you want something done, you roll up your sleeves and you do it yourself. And that's why I entered this race. I also got disgusted at seeing these cases, drunk drivers not being timely filed, or thieves and being released back into the community because they're not efficiently doing their job. So if I'm elected, time, money, and efficiency. That's my goal. Thank you. And Mr. Paul Graves. I love this community. I love this county and I have served you dedicated service for the last over 22 years. And one thing I've noticed about this community is, is we've got a lot of things we can talk about, but let's start with the important issue. I believe everybody in this community wants to be safe and they want victims treated with respect and dignity through the process. And I've been going to forums since last May, this is about the eighth or ninth, and we really spend little time, other than that last question, talking about victims of crime. And I can tell you that has defined me as a prosecutor for my entire career, is serving victims of crime. And to me, it is the single most important duty of a prosecutor. And I am obviously in the sexual assault unit. I see a lot. I see a lot of child victims. I see a lot of rape victims. And it's difficult. And people often ask me, how can you do that day in and day out? And you know, I'll tell you I, what I tell them. I have the rare privilege of walking among heroes every day because the people who have the courage to find their voice and come forward and speak out about abuse, whether they're a child, a teenager, or an adult, that takes real courage. And they're real heroes in every sense of the word. And I can guarantee you, while we can have a lot of discussions about a lot of things we can maybe do better in this community, the one thing I will not sacrifice as DA is those victims, those heroes. They will always be treated with respect and they will always be my first priority because I am a prosecutor. And Dina Becton. So as your district attorney, I will continue to work hard to keep our community safe and to give voice to the victims of crime in our community. But in addition to that, I will be doing so much more because I will be bringing a fresh set of eyes to solve the problems in our criminal justice system relating to our juveniles, relating to the low-level nonviolent offenses that uh, clog up our system, as well as uh, mental health issues, the criminalization of our mentally ill, bail reform, and also I will continue to do the work to give people a second chance so that those who are returning home from our jails and prisons also have an opportunity 
to clean their records and become productive members of society to get jobs and housing um, and uh, their license back. I have the endorsements of Governor Jerry Brown, Senator Kamala Harris, Congressman DeSalnier, McNerney, Swalwell, and Thompson, the California Nurses Association, labor, the building trades, civic leaders from around the county, as well as community leaders and community support, law enforcement, and defense attorneys. I have a broad spec uh, spectrum of support throughout the county, and I hope that I've also earned your support today as well. Thank you. Okay, these are your three candidates for district attorney in Contra Costa County. Um, they each have a table out in the back if you want any of their literature. The chamber has a table out in the back and as you leave, and so does the League of Women Voters have a table out in the back, all with literature. One of the things the League has is something about voters' choice. You can go on voters' choice and find out about all the other candidates that are out there on your ballot. Um, so we have lots of information for you, and I really want to thank the Chamber, the Pittsburgh Chamber, for sponsoring this with us, and also to thank all of you. You were very respectful and I, very attentive, and I think you learned a lot, and I want to give all, have you help me give all the candidates a big hand for this. <laughs> Thank you.